Welcome back to the Distance Learning live stream here. Now, we had kind of a mix up that happened here, but uh, that interview we were supposed to do, we're going to do it now. So, bringing back to the stage here is, uh, of course, my fabulous co host and beautiful cohort here, Phoenix. Hey, I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. I know, right? I haven't seen you in like in decades at this yeah. point, right? Yeah. Now, introducing right here, uh, I, got, I have to do the introductions here, is a, uh, is a gentleman that that is an actor, a, a, a book writer, musician. He's done all kinds of stuff and just really, really get into all this stuff. We have a writer, just a writer in general. Um, and, writer, and, and director, producer, veteran actor, musician, published author, journalist, and now features in the Netflix series Squid Games. Yes, let's let's bring him in. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Giuliano. Hey. How's it going, did miss, man? Did I miss any of them? <laughs> You've got quite the resume. I, I was kind of like in a quick hurry on that. So I was like, okay, I, I just got to kind of go off the top of my head. Uh, and do some of the things. I'm going to miss accolades like crazy at this point. <laughs> um, but how are you doing? I guess for us it's tonight, but good morning on your side. Yeah, good morning. It's 11.25. I think, I think we owe it to the audience to tell them that when I was sitting here waiting for this interview that was to, to start at 10 o'clock, two guys appeared on my screen and said, okay, you ready for the interview at 10 o'clock? And I went, yeah. And it wasn't. it was somebody else that apparently we double booked. So I, my apologies to everyone for that. Yeah, and again, I'm I'm not upset. Uh, you're here now, and we can just go ahead and do an interview here, and you know, just find out all the great things about not only you but about uh, Squid Game and everything. Uh, just kind of like your contributions in that. So I kind of wanted to throw a couple of different uh, um, kind of films that you've been in that kind of like jumped out at me. Uh, you were in Scorpion King three. Uh, you were in the Far Cry experience, which I love when they do the live action Far Cry stuff. Uh, yeah. Peninsula, which is the sequel to Train to Busan. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, we kind of wanted to make a uh, make this a big thing, but you were in two of the number one uh, stream things on Netflix simultaneously. You were in right. both Kate and Squid Game. Right. Uh, the Kate thing, I was on my way to somewhere to make a movie, and I got a call from a casting agent in Bangkok saying, would you like to do this movie with Woody Harrelson? And I said, no. And they said, what do you mean, no? I said, well, look, it's not a, it's not a very big part, and... At this point in building the brand, that I've never really done small parts, but I, I, it's too small. I don't want to do that. And they right. said, okay. So two weeks later, she called up and said, the director really wants you. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I can't. I'm, and then the, she called up two weeks and then she said, no, no, look, I'm going to get in trouble if you don't do this. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So <laughs> I just did that. And then it became some kind of big hit. The same thing with Squid Game. I had no idea any of this was going to happen. Right. And uh, I mean, you know, before we jump into Squid Game and everything like that, uh, there was a couple of things that I wanted to kind of get into as far as like getting to know you and the things that you're into and whatnot. So um, to get into that, uh, what's something that people are kind of nerding out on or that, that they're nerds about that people are obsessed with, but you just don't get the point of it? Uh, that the acting style in that movie was a characterization. It was specifically to be overblown and cartoonish and caric cartoonish isn't the right word, but it was a caricature of, uh, and, and I can give you an example, any movie by the Coen brothers, any mm -hmm. movie by Wes Anderson, Clockwork Orange, those characters were exaggerated on purpose. And that's mm -hmm. what this was. I, I, I can assure you I'm perfectly capable of Godfather two style naturalistic acting, which you can see in Peninsula Train to Busan. This is what I do. I don't do these kind of things very, no one asked me to do them. I'm perfectly, no one asked me to do comedy. I can also do comedy, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, they wanted this boss hog or this, uh, say, come over here. Hey, if I can't do 96, can't do 69, I'll do 96. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if they want that, I can do it. But a lot of people said, Oh, he's a, these are bad. He's a bad actor. He don't, hey, dude, that's what they told me to do. They're the employers, you know? Yeah. So Pretty much when Netflix tells you to do something and you're an actor, you got to do it, man. So I, yeah. I, I always tell people if, uh, if, if, you know, don't blame the actor, blame the pages, you know, the, the right. That's 100% true. Like, see, for yeah. me, I, 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 I don't think that there was any bad acting in this. I think you did exactly what, what your character was supposed to do. 
your character, when I looked at your character, you evoked a lot of hatred yeah. like, from me. And that's, to me, that's good acting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you can play the character, if you can make me hate you as a person, that means that you're doing your job as an actor because it's it's the same thing. We talked about it earlier with yeah. uh, Lena Hetty, right? Lena like, Hedley, look at yeah. Lena Hedley when, in her characters. Uh, she talks about how at cons, she doesn't, uh, people don't want to get her autograph because they hate her characters. She's doing yeah. her job. You know what I mean? Like, that's the whole thing. That's If you can make me hate you, then you're doing your job as an actor. Look, if, if I murder someone in a movie, uh-huh. When I go backstage, the homicide bureau isn't there to slap the cuffs on me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me. Yeah. Oh, me. yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm just about to do comic cons as my sort of backup career. I hope people are going to want my autograph. Oh, I mean, I'm sure I'll, people will. I'll be in line. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would get your signature in a heartbeat again, because I know, I, I know how to disconnect actors from the characters they play. Right. So again, yeah. if you are playing a character and you make me hate you, then you're doing a good job at that. If you, if you liked me. Yeah. There's something wrong with you and something wrong with me. And <laughs> right. something yeah. wrong with Netflix. Right. Look, Net, yeah. Netflix has a big pair of scissors in Hollywood. And if somebody, <laughs> if somebody sucks, they say, get the scissors out, Joe, and they cut you out of the movie, man. Right. It's right. happened to me, everybody. It's happened to every actor. Right. So uh, not you one actually, word about I was going to say, of the VIPs, you were the one I gravitated towards the most. You know I, what I mean? Was, no, I had a part. The other guys were, got, they're nice guys, but they were featured extras in this right. movie. Right, right. I mean, the guys had like one or two lines, but really, if anything, they were responding to your performance because you actually had a performance. You know, from the beginning, like you were the one that had the most lines from the beginning up, up until the part where, again, where you just made me hate you. Again, I made me hate your character. Um, you know, it was, you yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, excuse me. What was unfair about that was the negative depiction of homosexuality. It wasn't that. that. Yeah, it wasn't that that I, made I, me hate I, you. I, I, that, no, I understand that. But yeah. I'm just telling you that that was a not a fair and balanced depiction of yeah. uh, homosexual as a predatory, as evil, is going to kill somebody, wants to have sex, and then, you know, no, this is so, to all my brothers and sisters, LGBTQ uh, brothers and sisters, I have to apologize, but hey, I'm just an actor, and this is what they told me to do. Right, right, and again, going to that, like, that's not how I felt with the character, I felt more that that character in itself, he was just a monster, you know, yeah. like, so... I don't uh I I don't I don't look at it as oh he's a homosexual so he was a monster it was no the dude himself <laughs> was a monster but yeah. in the world in the world in the make america great world that we seem to has been imposed upon us uh, people could draw those inferences so I just want to make that distinction right 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 yeah definitely and and you know I it could be maybe a little bit uh, cultural um, where it's it's the the culture comes through and it's hard to uh, to discern because you are uh, catering to American audience as well. It's it's very mm -hmm. different two worlds that you're uh, catering to at the same time. Right. Yeah. Well, you listen. That movie was never intended to be anything but a Korean movie made by Koreans to yeah. be played in Korea. There was a little bit of a spillover to the rest of the world because there's nothing that's local anymore. Everything's on the internet. So it was a complete shock to everyone that this thing happened that like the Beatles or Titanic it's just nobody could have ever known that any of this was going to occur right you never know what's going to go viral he says right I, I mean I don't even know I didn't really know under, I'm over 60 I don't understand any of it but I, I had no expectation that this would be anything <laughs> other than another acting assignment well not many people know uh, speaking of your experience with acting that you have a master's degree right I do for, for, for all the good that it could, could, could. And, and In those days, Jimmy Carter paid people to stay in school. Mm -hmm. So it's, I yeah. got a check every month. So I said, well, it's better than working. So I got a master's degree in Shakespeare, man. In Shakespeare. Shakespeare. I've wow. never used it ever. What's your favorite uh, play? I have to ask. Macbeth. Macbeth. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so, so you have uh, quite an experience on, on stage as well. Yeah, and, and that was a big problem for me because when I went to movies, which is what I always wanted to do, I had to uh, I had to unlearn everything that I had learned as a stage actor because it's very big. And where are you going, my lord? And uh, you know, you can't do that. everything's in a right. little tiny box in a movie. Which one do you in prefer? Fact, I, I, I made a movie with William Hurt once, and he was two feet away from me, and he was talking to the other guy in the scene. It was like this. It was like. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nothing happened. But it was just like like real talking, you know. So I th- I learned a big lesson at that moment. I said, oh, I see. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, yeah. the film acting for me, it just kind of dropped on me one day where I just figured it out. How do they mm-hmm. do that again? You know, and then it just like, boom, I knew how they did it. And I knew how they did it by making movies, but I probably didn't know too much of my first couple of movies. But as you gain experience, you kind of, there's there's a technique for movie acting, which mm-hmm. is different right. than any other type of acting. So you did the the night after night thing professionally for a little while. The on um, you walked the boards. I did. I did. I well, I started in theater, and because it's the it's a it's a, something that happens on a community level. I mean, you don't get a chance to make a motion picture ever. Um, and when I went to university, in fact, I went to this head and said, "You got a camera department over across the street, yeah? And you got actors over here. Why don't you put them together and we make little movies together?" Oh, I never thought of that. So this thing that happens everywhere now, full sale and all these schools, none of that happened in the '70s when I was in school. So look, for me, a kid from Alcott Beach, New York, near Niagara Falls in Western New York, to have made 28 movies and to be in a very famous movie is something that I always wanted but could never envision. Right. I only I only got here through unceasingly hard work and heartbreak. Yeah. I mean, that's the life of an actor though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, the insecurity, the never knowing where the money's going to come from. It's very and and even now I'm still looking for work, you know, I'm, I'm there was an right. article in Newsweek magazine a couple of weeks ago that said Jeffrey Giuliano was a global star. <laughs> but I haven't gotten a, a, an offer for another movie yet. I've gotten other offers for comic cons, which I'm going to do. Right. But uh, no movie. And, and I think that people, there's a couple of things. I used to know a guy that was a drummer for Paul McCartney. And I, I yeah. saw him after, after he left. I said, how you doing, man? He said, terrible. What do you mean? He said, well, people think when you work for Paul McCartney that you're too expensive or that you've got a gig and no one bothers to call you. Mm-hmm. So it's like Jeffrey was a big star in Squid Game. I'm sure he's busy. I mean, a guy like that is going to be too expensive or whatever, and I'm not getting the calls. So if there's anyone out there watching, I'm definitely available to make your movie. Speaking of the Beatles, you have uh, 30 books about them, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I did that because I wasn't getting any movies. Just like I opened, I started an audiobook company called Icon Audiobooks because mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to give my life to being an actor. I'm not going to make my family suffer and I'm not going to just wait for that phone to ring. And, and unless you're a real A-lister, which is almost nobody, though it's like a half of a one hundredth of a percent of the actors that can pick their own roles, you got to wait for the phone to ring, you know, or make the phone ring. But, you know, after a while, you get tired of harassing people to give you a part or casting directors. There's a lady called Ivy Eisenberg in Hollywood that put me in a couple of movies. And so, you know, it's like if I don't have a gig, I'll write Ivy. And I know she's thinking, God, this guy again, you know, so you have to, you have to be annoying. You have to annoy people to to get this thing to happen. But I'll tell you, for you to get to the part where it's automatic, people call you, um, is I'm not there yet. I still have to hustle around to get something going. Right, right. But you you have announced uh, some future projects coming up. Uh, Not really, not now. I, I have... I have Comic Con. I have an audio book coming out called I Am VIP. Uh, what's it called? Surviving Squid Game. I Am VIP Four. That'll be out in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, but I don't. I don't have a movie. I, I might have said that, and there might have been something. There was something in the beginning. But you know, there's a lot of fraudsters involved in the movie making business too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People want to use your name to raise money. You got to be very right. careful about that. There's a, yeah. there's a contract called pay to play. Which means if you're going to use my name to raise money for a movie, you got to pay me. Right. A lot of people try to circumvent that little technicality and start using your name anyway. So there was somebody down in New Orleans that tried to use my name uh, and my position in Squid Game to raise money so they could make a feature film. And whether they're going to use me or not, I don't know. I had to put a stop to that. So that might be what you're referring to. Okay. Uh, Circling back to the Beatles, because you mentioned the Beatles a few minutes ago. uh, One of your uh, books was actually made into a movie, too. So the kind of the world collide. That's right. That's right. That was an amazing experience where a book I wrote called Painted Black, The Murder of Brian Jones for Richard Branson at Virgin uh, at Virgin was made into a movie called Stoned in 2006, which is the only movie that's ever been made about the Rolling Stones. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. And I was really broke. And I went to the ATM. I was complete. I was in Bangkok. I was living with my girlfriend, and I, I went to the ATM, and I, you know, there's maybe ten dollars in there, and I went, and there was a hundred thousand dollars in there. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What, what, what? Oh, listen, it, it, it's a mistake. So let's take as much as we can out. <laughs> They're going to realize, and, and then it's just going to go back to $10 again. So we're taking all this money, and I'm putting it here and putting it there. And suddenly I realized, wait a minute. That's the money from that movie. So what happens is it, when you sell a book to a movies is you get paid on the first day of principal photography. Oh. So it's like, I didn't know. And I said, oh, man, that's from that movie. That's what that is. So, yeah, so that was like 100 grand that came into my account. I had no idea. So these things happen in the life of an actor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, and not just uh, some of the, the other books you've written, but you've worked with uh, Rolling Stone, Sunday People, Daily Mail, The News of the World. Oh, things are getting moved around. Uh, Mail and Sunday Hi, Girl. Uh, what was that like? You've been a journalist. Well, I did it when you made lots of money. Like you would do a story on something and they'd give you like $40,000 and stuff like that, you know? So it was, it was extremely lucrative. Uh, I made a lot of money. I lived, bought a big mansion and I don't have any more, but I had all that abode and everything stables. And I, I made lots and lots of money from being an actor. Uh, sorry, being a writer and significantly less so being uh, uh, an actor, but that's where my heart was. You know, I started out to be an actor. I always want, I am an actor. See, it's not, it's kind of like, it's not something you do. It's something you are. Right. You know? Yeah. My mother used to say, Oh, you're always acting. Just be yourself. And I said, this is it. This is what it is. You know, people used to say that about Peter Sellers, that, you know, he's <laughs> always acting. And I understand what that means, And uh, but it can become obsessive compulsive. You can become Robin Williams and kill yourself. Yeah. yeah. You can't control every time anyone gives you an opportunity to, to make a funny joke or speak in a funny voice, you take it and then slowly you become unhinged. So I've been practicing meditation for many, many decades, and that's what keeps me anchored. So when the boat starts drifting this way or that way, the anchor will slowly pull it back to center. No, and no, I appreciate that. That's that's in this industry, you have to stay sane. Because, I mean, a lot can happen. Um, I, I mean, I got a lot, a lot can't happen. It's true. Stuff, stuff not happening is more uh, is more the thing, the way it goes than stuff happening. Yeah. 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 So quick question for you here. Uh, what, what was your first job in the industry? Well, movie making, it was called Jewel, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island with Ooh. Patrick Stewart and Kyle mclaughlin or something like that from something called twin peaks and vinnie jones um and that my first part was a really big part and um yeah that, for the hallmark channel that was my first movie and, and it was based on the jules verne title so that's i mean i'm i'm already interested in that i might have to go go through the archives and go watch that just because it's jules verne but also because you're in it i mean come on why not yeah uh, um <laughs> what was uh what was your first oh my god i made it project well i when you when you make your first movie mm -hmm. you call everyone in your family and you go that's it i've made it i'm a movie star i'm robert de niro and of course that doesn't happen mm -hmm. there's an expression myself and my uh, friends use which is moving the needle so we always look at a project when it's over and say well did it move the needle no yeah i got paid i got paid it's on TV. It's on the, but it didn't move the needle. Squid Game moved the needle. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, what are some of your career highlights? So, and it doesn't have to be like movies that you were in or projects you were in, like people you've met or um, just kind of the like Beatles. The Beatles. Working with Paul McCartney on a book with John Lennon's sister was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Having my book uh, on Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones made into a movie called Stone. The whole movie's on. Uh, YouTube, if you want to watch it. Um, let's see. Uh, making my first. I was a millionaire at 30 from those books. But there's a funny story. There's a, I'm not anymore. It was a funny story because the Beatles were millionaires at 21, 22. Right. And I was a millionaire at 30. And I thought I was a failure. You know, I thought I was. I'm over 60 now. And I think I was a millionaire. But 
<clears throat> at the time I thought, well, you know, I didn't do it when I was 22, 20 and 30. So I guess it doesn't really count, uh, but it, it did count. Um, so, so, so yeah, I was, I, okay. Making my first million dollars was a very big deal. Um, and, uh, losing my last million dollars was an even bigger deal. <laughs> that is not hard to do though. That is That's very easy. Yeah. Super easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I, I, I didn't have to think about money for 20 years. My, my, my wife used to, I got a big sculpture coming out of my head here of Ganesh because I didn't have time to fool around with the camera. See, there it is. But anyway, <laughs> what, what, this was an emergency situation. Anyway, so please, <laughs> I'm trying to keep my head up here to block the statue. Um, someone just wrote something. Can we see what that says? It seems like oh, I've had a cool. you've had a hard day. Seems like you've had a lot of heartache with a lot of fun. No amount yeah, of money this, this, this is people kill themselves over this stuff. Yeah, they do. You know? Unless you're kind of or take fentanyl or you know uh, neglect themselves and their children. And I just saw Heather Locklear is in a drug rehabilitation. All this stuff happens, but it right. didn't happen to me because yeah. I have meditation. I have my meditation. I have my Indian philosophical religious beliefs. And they keep me on track so that I can walk away from stuff. Right. And now, this is just another kind of little movie inside the movie of my life that happened. It has no great import in the total scheme of my existence. So it's been, in fact, I call this my heartbreaking hobby. I call this my heartbreaking hobby. Like, like my glasses, I can never get them straight. <laughs> But anyway, okay, so these are the things, you know, people say, oh, he's a narcissist. Dude, dude, if you're going to, like, put yourself out and start performing for other people, of course yeah. you're a narcissist. But there's degree, Donald Trump would be, I would call a toxic narcissist, if, if I were <laughs> to say something about this, that guy, jerk. Um, but uh, I, I, there's a little bit of healthy narcissism that you need in order to make you perform. Hey, look at me. Right. Look at me, yeah. you know. It's weird. Right. I mean, I, I do interviews. So, I mean, you know, like in yeah. Phoenix's interviews too. So we, we get that. You know, there's a level yeah. of narcissism you have to have in order to do this. Like you, I, I, I crack all the stupidest jokes just because I want the attention. And I mean, that's peeling back the layer, right? So. Yeah. No, there, 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 there's a thing like mommy and daddy, you know, mommy, or what, what Austin Powers said, daddy wasn't there to take me to the fair. I guess he didn't care. So there's some kind of something I think that people that have become performers didn't get mm -hmm. at home, didn't get where they feel the need that they, they now, they maybe didn't get the love and approbation at home. So they want to get it from complete strangers. But I got to tell you at my age, what I want is the money so that I can take care of my son. I'm, I'm a single father over 60 and I have a 14 year old son. Okay. And he's not going to have a father when he's my age or 40 or even probably 30. So I have to really think what can, everything I do in this world, everything that isn't involuntary, like my heart beating or breathing, I put on a scale and say, is it good for Eden? How will this affect Eden? Right. You know, and that's what I do. Now, how did you find your religious beliefs is what was religion? I was raised in no religion. When I was 15, I was at a rock concert and I saw some Hare Krishna devotees. I didn't know what that was. I thought they were guys that took a bunch of acid, put on a woman's dress and shaved their head. I had no idea what the Hare Krishna movement was. But I they somehow I spoke to them. They gave me a pamphlet. They gave me a Bhagavad Gita. And I am, you know, this used to be a big thing that people didn't want to talk about. I'm a Hare Krishna. You know, and it's done me nothing but good. Um, I go to India once or twice a year. I meditate every day. I don't eat meat, fish, or eggs. I don't take any intoxication. I don't hurt anyone. I don't rip anybody off. Um, and it's it's been a great anchor for me. And I tell people, hey, if you know, because there's this whole thing when you die, this is going to happen. And I said, look, man, I don't know nothing about that. Problem, there's, you know, it's a 50 50. Either with, there's nothing or there's Krishna or Jesus, you know, but that's not my business. My business is to be as the best person, the best Jeffrey I can be right. now and try to make a positive impact in the world. And unlike many other people, because of Krishna consciousness, I don't have a big millstone around my neck of intoxication, of you know, be, being uh, uh, cold to the plight of animals. Um, I, I, I'm free from a right. lot of the things that other people are locked up with. Right. Because you've been a vegetarian since the 70s, right? 
I think 68 or 69, my father you forbid me to be a vegetarian. You cannot be a vegetarian. You've got to eat meat. You know, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a level of masculinity to to eating meat. And again, that's kind of like that toxic upbringing. Right. But I mean, like, you know, like I'm, I, I eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian, but I also understand the, the, the beliefs behind that. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm going to tell you what changed my life mm -hmm. when I was. I was in 1967, I was 12 or 13 and an older boy called Pat approached me in the lunchroom and sold. He said, you want some LSD? And I said, well, what's that? Or something stupid. And he said, well, you know, and it was $4. So I saved up my, my, I gave him 25 cents a day for my lunch money. And I got this little pill of LSD. Now in those days, the LSD was extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. So I was this sort of nerdy kid and I took this LSD and I thought, okay, there's the consensus reality that we all share, that we all agree upon um, by committee. And then there's also other realities as well. And as George Harrison said, you only need to take LSD one time. Although both he and I took it several times, you know, I, I, went, <laughs> past, I went past it, but it did open up some corridors of my mind, which allowed me to, to be a better person for mm -hmm. sure. And that doesn't mean I'm telling people to go and snort fentanyl. Right. It means that in the Please six, don't. yeah, <laughs> in the, in the, actually, you can't take any drug that's a powder now because they mix fentanyl and everything to make yeah. more money. So, you know, you're yeah. die. No, are dying. There are certain yeah, yeah. things that will open up, you know, your pineal gland that'll open up your, your, all your that, all that. Like, you know, I would be, I'd be really afraid to take psychedelics now, but when I was young and I was a kid, mm -hmm. it was helpful to me and it moved me towards meditation, which was really helpful mm -hmm. for me. All right. Uh, so go, no, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. We'll ask some of the nerdy questions and then get another the brass tacks. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to start jumping in the squid game here. Um, oh, yeah. So well, before before that, um, a little bit uh, more. You do uh, literally, uh, sorry, I'm like literary yeah. publishing uh, company. I have a, I have an audiobook publishing company. Audiobook pu publishing. So I, I, I've always done a lot of narration. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, before I made my own company I could only do that when I was hired to do that mm -hmm. and then I was sitting on that sofa over there and I thought man I don't have a gig and hey wait a minute I've done a lot of audiobooks I remember I used to work for that company I made a lot of money I'm going to start my own so we started it in 2017 and now it's the biggest independent audiobook company in the world it's called Icon Audio Arts or Icon Audiobooks and um it's something I do every day. When we when we click off from this thing, I'll be working on audiobooks all day. Nice. So, so yeah. Uh, so I do, I, I'm a good. I'm a good. I'm a pretty good narrator, I guess. I've done it for so many <laughs> years that I I we do original audiobooks. Yeah, original I mean, audio thing is, is when you're interested in hearing the person talk. Like I'm I'm interested in everything you say, so I, I can imagine that your audiobooks. Although are this is a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> I guess say and you love it so we're good exactly <laughs> um the question i have written here was before i designed I this t-shirt i designed this Godzilla oh, you designed that one? yes i did nice oh cool funny because we just did a, like a a whole bunch of interviews with a bunch of kaiju actors so it's like it's that's pretty awesome <laughs> um, well, listen, if, if, let me just say if anybody wants me to come to their comic con get in touch with my manager van and we'll do that I, okay. I do have to ask too because you mentioned you had a young son. Are you planning on taking him to Comic Cons? Because that is so much fun for a kid. Yeah, I mean, if he's not in school, I mean, okay. I'm kind of I'm kind of stuck in Thailand until the school year's out. But in uh, in June, uh, yeah, he'll travel. He he comes to most of my movies. Now, now school's quite quite serious now because he's just turned turning fourteen, so he has to really study. But before that. I was pretty loose. I'm a bit of a hippie in philosophy. So I would take him from movie set to movie set. And uh, so he's grown up around all of that stuff. He's not very impressed with it. And he doesn't want to be an actor. Thank God. Oh, yeah. What, is, what does he want to be? Do you, does he know yet? Uh, he wants to be a, a psychiatric counselor, which is probably a direct result of being my son. <laughs> I mean, 
good for him. I mean, maybe he can uh, put dad in a, in a nice, uh, you know, retirement. Like, doctor doctor. Jack. <laughs> no, doctor listen, man, a lot. You, you listen, you have to be crazy to be an actor. I mean, it's, yeah. don't let anybody say anything different than that. But, so what do you do for a living? I pretend to be other people. And what do you do? Well, I pretend to be other people, but I'm in a lunatic asylum. So it's a strange thing. Jackie wants me to hire her. What do you want me to hire you for, Jackie? Oh, your his your son can hire hire her later when he has a he opens his own. Um, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure there's no there'll be no shortage of customers to be uh, yeah. to be treated by my maybe, son. Maybe maybe he'll write a book about dear old dad and and growing up under you. <laughs> You know, he's working for the audiobook company now. He's doing all of our covers and he's doing some editing on Pro Tools and stuff. Oh, nice. Um, one of the things I worry about is this makes, you know, it makes good money every month. So I said, Eden, when I die, you know, don't stop making the audiobooks. You can do whatever you want, but make sure you keep pumping out these audiobooks. Because what I do is I, I, this is a little boring. I won't talk much about it, but on the hard drive, I'll have all these introductions, generic introductions. And I said, well, just when I die, like like uh, Jigsaw, just put it together with this introduction and then would throw in the audio. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So I hope that the, the business continues for a long time. It's good business because nobody reads printed books anymore. Who does that? No. Just listen to books. Who has time? I mean, uh, I've, I've, yeah, you, you can find time. <laughs> I still read comic books. <laughs> well, that's a different thing. Mm, kind of. I mean, you know, I, I just read a book on podcasting, but I mean, that's a whole different monster. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> he's jumping off of that. Uh, again, I was, I was going to ask a question that pretty much I, I kind of already, we've already answered in here and it was really just doing research on your character for VIP four. Obviously, there wasn't any research that was done because of what they gave you, right? Um, no, that's, that's, not, that's not, no, 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 I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm. So yeah. actors have a way that we approach a role. Mm -hmm. if, we're given, if we're given the script, if we have rehearsals, then we know everything. It unlocks mm -hmm. everything. But if we're not, in this case I wasn't, you can go to my YouTube channel, the Jeffrey Giuliano channel, and you can see an improvisation that I did with a film crew at my own expense to try to explore the mind of the character. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what you do when they don't give you any information. You look at everything that's written down and you go, he's this old, this is his sexual proclivity. This is his financial, da, 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 whatever facts you can get. And mm -hmm. then you, in my case, not you do, this is what I do is that I, even you could do it on your cell phone. I just happen to know a lot of film people. So I, gave him a hundred bucks to come over and we spent a day just doing improvisations and mm -hmm. one of them, I put on my, my YouTube channel. So <clears throat> it's like what I think I take the script and then I take it forward or backward and try to explore so that when I'm on the set, what I don't like is these goofy people. I mean, I goofy. I know a lot of people like Lady Gaga. I don't consider her an actress, much of an actress. Um, but, you know, she got into this thing of method acting where people had to call her, Marie or whatever the character's name oh, was for six, yeah. six weeks. You know, I don't do that. I think that's insane. I just, you know, I'm, I'm brought, I, I learn the words I, and I think about it and then I approximate and bring as much as I can to the character within the bounds of sanity. Yeah. And then I let it go when they say cut. Yeah. It's like what Pacino did on Scarface where you can only talk to me in Spanish, that kind of thing. Right. You know, like yeah. I didn't know that I was yeah. supposed to be in Scarface was my first professional audition. Oh yeah, no. I had to shoot for that movie. Yeah, as one of the guys, the friends when I used to be young and good looking. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Pacino talks about how uh, he only allowed people to talk to him in Spanish, and if they talked to him in English, it had to be with uh, uh, a Cuban accent, so that he could get being a Cuban down. Yeah, um, I've always been able to do accents. The only two accents I cannot do are Australian and South African. They always end up sounding like Cockney. I suppose I could mm -hmm. have someone tutored me in them, but mm -hmm. um, I'm a character actor. I do voices. I do mm -hmm. those kind of things. But unfortunately, because I'm Sicilian, um, people ask me to play these mafia hoods all the time. This was a what I called, I, I, when I was telling people about this film, I said it's a gay godfather, which I think <laughs> is pretty much pretty much what it is. And like like when, 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 when I watched the show, you know, like what I saw that you got down is is really you just needed rich entitlement. 
that was this, essentially your character's like main whole thing is this dude's super rich and kind of just it, it, it's again like the way that I interpreted the character is that he thinks that he can do whatever he wants, mm-hmm. right? Hence the kind and, of and, and, until, until he couldn't, couldn't do what he wanted. And oh yeah. Yeah. But, exactly. But I mean, like the whole thing being that, like, that's the way he, that's the reason why he did what he did with the police officer. Well, obviously didn't know he was a cop, but I mean, like still, you know, the reason he did what he did again, I don't think that the motivation was because he was predatory gay. It was more because he was, I can do what, what I want. And because I'm rich, I can get away with anything, which means I can do what I want. You know, that's, and, and I felt that you, well, got yeah, that well, well, yeah, cause I, if you don't do what I say, yeah. I'll kill you before I leave. <laughs> exactly. Like I felt like you had that character down. Again, I think your advantage with uh, with every other VIP that was there was that you did have a, an actual character rather than part. being extra. <laughs> right. No, that, there was a weird thing that went on initially where they talked about the VIPs. The VIPs, like we were a rock group. Yeah. And I had I, I went along with that for a little bit when they started saying the VIPs sucked. I said, okay, well, hold on a minute. Th- those guys got four hundred dollars a day. For three days, you know, they were extras. And if you have a line and you're an extra, it's called a featured extra. They were right. featured extra at 400 bucks a day. I won't tell you what I made, but it was a little bit more than $400 a day. Yeah. So um, there's no VIPs. There was me and then there was two featured extras. Nice guys that they are. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they don't really figure into it. They didn't. The part wasn't big enough. Right. Did you get to know them on the set while you were sitting there? No, we just no. introduced. Hi, this is Joe. This is John. This is my, you know, hi, how are you? And go. Now I got to know them afterwards and they're all really, they're not, look, they're not, ex- I've been in this business a long time mm-hmm. and I've done producing, directing, writing and acting and hustling and raising money. I've done all the component parts and these guys are significantly younger than me. And they just don't have the experience. But I will tell you that when I was young, I used to hang around with the old actors, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would befriend them because I knew they knew about stuff, you know. And now I'm an old actor and I definitely know how this business works, how heartbreaking it can be. And uh, but I got to tell you that nobody saw this coming. I had no idea that uh, that I would. I'm a famous guy now, you know, I mean, I go outside and stuff. When I go to a mall and, hey, aren't you that guy? And my next door neighbor said, can I have, he's been my neighbor for five years. He said, can I have your autograph? Because, <laughs> I mean, Dude, I, it's a true global phenomenon. Me, you see me taking out the garbage. Now you want my autograph? So it's it's weird. Thing. It's a weird thing. Yeah. Um, I, got, so- I, got, I, got, I got the sculpture out of my head by leaning this way. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, so so the casting call on this, was it a normal casting call or was no, it something no, different? No, 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 I figured it's no, something no. different because of the way that the character was and everything. It had uh, to be like. Uh, there's, there's a whole story. Okay. It's, uh, I was in this really good movie. I, I'm happy with my performance and they're very happy. Called uh, Peninsula Train to Busan, which you can mm-hmm. see on Netflix right now. And um, the director saw me in that and they asked me to. Uh, they asked me to audition and I did and they gave me the part and then they didn't. And then they said, no, probably it was because I, uh, um, something about money, probably. But they said yes. Then they said no. And I said, OK. And then they said yes again. And I said, OK. And um, so it was the director saw me in Peninsula Train to Busan. And that's how I got the role. And I also was told that they auditioned, quote unquote, everybody in Korea and uh, couldn't find anyone they wanted, so they they came to me. Now they they could have gone, they could have gotten a Hollywood star for this. Look, I'm an actor. I'm not a. I mean, I, before this, I don't know. I don't know what I am now, but maybe some kind of very small C list star. <clears throat> but before this, I was definitely just a, just a working actor, journeyman actor, journeyman actor. Yeah. Um, so and I still even you know if I was. I'll tell you, the, 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 the impacts of my life have been that people contact me. There's a fan page called Squid Game Forest, VIP, or VIP Forest Squid Game Universe on Facebook. I have fans who want this and want that. And, and I always, always, as much as I can, which is a lot, accommodate fans. If somebody needs an autograph or 
a shout out or happy birthday. I'm happy to do that because, <clears throat> you know, you can be an actor without a fan, but you can't be a star without a fan. Mm -hmm. And what, why do I want to be a movie star? So I have more opportunity to work. Right. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> and money and money to take care of my son and money to take yeah. care of my, you know, see, this is another thing with my religious views or uh, there's nothing I want. I've already been uh, everything, but let's talk to James Navarro. He says, what do you see in store for your role for season two of squid game? Okay. Let's talk about that. Why do I think I'm going to be in season two? I don't know. And they don't tell you. Right. Um, Cause they call you when they want you, not when you want to be wanted. So two things, one, when the policeman knocked me out, which you don't see, right? I'm laying there naked on the floor, which was extremely uncomfortable and embarrassing. And while well, they fooled around with lights for 45 minutes, um, the guy comes in the room and he says, VIP is down. Is he dead? No, he's just unconscious. Why did they do that? Why right. did they make, why did they make that scene? That scene has no relation to anything. It's never mentioned again. <clears throat> Scenes are not made by accident over at right. Netflix. 300 people got to fool around to make that scene. They have mm -hmm. to rent equipment. They have to have people standing by. They have to have all kinds of technicians. They don't make, hey, let's just shoot this for, for no reason. Right. So there's some reason that they made a scene. Is he dead? No, he's just unconscious. So that's reason number one. I think I'm going to be in season two. Because they could have easily killed your character off, and they well, didn't. No, the guy could have just punched me, and then I fall back out of frame and cut. Right. Yeah. You know? Why did they make a whole other scene? And I was there. Right. It took like two or two and two three hours to make that little scene of the guy walking in the room. So, so I had think, to go ahead. Maybe you'll be a big problem next season. <laughs> I'm always a problem, but maybe I'll be a problem on Netflix next season. Okay. So there's another. There's another reason. There's another thing. That's number one. Number two, you'll notice when I'm in that room, when I say, hey, you, to the, to the guy to bring me the drink, mm -hmm. he lets a camera drop from up somewhere in his sleeve and he takes video of me. That's never explained. Right. It's never referenced. It's a close up. Everything was done on a storyboard. So some, the director said to the artist, okay, make that drop out. Why? What, what they don't film things they're not going to use right. they don't they don't pay money to film things that are irrelevant Otherwise so there's can. two reasons i think i'll be in season 2 i have no idea but they 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 made a big thing about filming me well what's he going to do with that film it's never explained mm -hmm. and, and the third reason i'll be in squid game season 2 i think is because the director said the other day, about 10 days ago, that it was not going to be a prequel. Anyone who's dead is dead, and almost everyone is dead, mm -hmm. except me, the head man, the star, and whoever else you guys would know better than me. Mm -hmm. So I you think there's a yeah, you might have a showdown. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, what it looks like at the end is that he's... Um... Spoilers for anybody who hasn't watched the show, but I mean, you know, uh, it, it seems like he's going to go after like trying to shut down the organization. The VIPs obviously are dudes who, uh, you know, they're, they're basically the guys who bet on the horse race. Right. So he's going to probably start. going. Well, well, wait a minute. No, there's another. OK, there's actually a fourth one. I just remembered. Mm -hmm. There's a line that was originally given to me, but it was given to another actor at, at the last minute. That's fine. He said, I really it was that Chinese guy. I really appreciate that you had this, the games in Korea this year. What does that mean? That in I missed other that. Year? Yeah. So in other words, oh, you have them somewhere else. This isn't the first one. This is an annual event. And right. then the guy walking down the stairs. Oh, listen, we have big screen TVs in America, but there's nothing like coming and seeing it in person. Oh, I see you've done this before. Right. So well, we know maybe, that. Right. Right. Go ahead, go ahead, Phoenix. Some, some family, some 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 fans uh, are saying that it might be kind of like uh, they do Hunger Games, like there's different districts and and you right. know, yeah, yeah. Because what? Okay, we'll think think about this. This was a Korean thing that got out of control, mm -hmm. like coronavirus leaving the laboratory. No one knew this shit was going to happen. Right. So 
since it's so popular in the West and that wasn't anticipated, maybe those producers are going to say some shit like, well, why don't we have this in New York this time or San Francisco? Mm-hmm. You know, since it's so it made nine, almost a billion dollars. Uh, I think that we owe it to our audience to have a more Western content. And if they do look, I have the biggest part of any non-Korean or Western actor, strictly Western actor, not from Asia in that movie. I have the biggest part. So if they are going to bring anyone back who's not Korean or Indian, I guess there's an Indian gentleman, um, it would be me, I would say. Right. Right. Um, That's that's why I'm being very polite with Netflix. I mean, I have some problems with it. (laughs) There's an old saying, how do you make an actor... Or how do you make an actor complain? Give him a job. <laughs> oh, the dressing room wasn't big enough. They were late bringing me, and I have to wait for the guy to take me back. And there's no place to hang my jet. Whatever it is. So I never look. There's a lot of people that want to be movie stars here. You know, if you put in an ad, movie star, come at four o'clock tomorrow. You'll have a line. You know, from here to the moon. So if you're in a favored position that you worked your life and oriented your life so that you can be some kind of a movie actor in big movies, you are, should be very grateful. Do you, do I, you ever, do you ever use an M&M clause on your, on your contracts? No, I would there, never, no, <laughs> man. No, I don't even, you know, and that's, I'm really a goof about it because I could ask for a lot more than I get, but you know, I understand how easily people can be replaced. Now maybe well, not, not, okay, let's put it this way. My next contract for my next film, We'll have some, I'll tell you the kind of things that are important to me. Like my billing in this was mm-hmm. microscopic. Like if you see the credits roll, no, next time it'll be like, okay, this is the billing. This is where it'll be. This is the size of the font and the text. And <laughs> all you have to, all that's in the contract. I never did. And I, and I would like a dressing room too. Why? Because I have a big ego. No, it's lonely in a dressing room. So I can prepare and get into character and do a better job on screen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just going to go back and mention uh, in, in the show, they do date uh, <coughs> games back to 99. So basically it started in 99 because the whole thing is how he figures out that uh, that his brother's involved is he uh, he starts looking through all the records because they have records of all the, the, the winners and the losers and who won all the rounds and everything like that. So it dates back on you. If you pay attention to like the Easter eggs on there, it, the, the earliest book that's <coughs> going to go is 1999. Yeah, uh, but, you know, I, I got to tell you that, well, I'll tell you a little story about the director. Mm-hmm. The director, I asked, I didn't want to do those 69. Hey, 69, it's my it's a beautiful number. Or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the other one is, uh, hey, if I can't do 69, I'll do 96. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't want to necessarily do those because they're stupid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I just didn't want to do them. And so I asked, could I, because I'm a writer and I've written scripts and everything. I said, well, can I rewrite that? No, not. Nah, we, didn't, we didn't, we engaged you as an actor, Mr. Giuliano, not as a writer. Okay. So just, <laughs> why don't you just do what's written? There? So then I tried again. When I got on set, I tried to change it. I thought nobody would notice. Suddenly there's a voice, Mr. Giuliano, would you please stick to the script? So I did. Hey, if I can't do 69, I'm going to do 96. You know, stupid. Anyway. And then Is I there got, a language barrier on set? Let me just say, then I got criticized for it in the media. It's like, well, he's telling us Jeffrey Giuliano's talking about six. No, I'm not. It was in a script, man. It was in a script. I had to say it. I'm sorry. What was your question, sir? I, I was saying, uh, was there was there like a big language barrier on the set? or? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Huh? So no, it was uh, it was it was a little tough. It was, mm. well, even tougher was the fact that I'm a vegetarian and they don't know, really have that in Korea. Yeah, uh, I actually. What's funny is I actually interviewed uh, somebody who wrote a book about traveling in Korea, and he specifically talks about it in both of his books uh, that there's not really any uh, food allergies in Korea, and there's not like. You know, you can't say hold this or do this or you want like specific things. It's basically food comes as it is. 
Right. And when that when I told them I didn't eat, well, they well, what do you mean? What don't you eat? I don't eat meat, fish, or eggs. So every meal, literally, uh, not on this movie, but on Peninsula, they bring me a bag from 7-Eleven that had a croissant, a cookie, and yogurt, and some orange juice that was that sugary syrup crap that's never seen an orange a day in its life. And I said, yeah, I, but I can't eat this. You got to be careful because you can get a uh, reputation of being difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. so, so I said, well, um, in a very nice way, I said, well, you know, I can't really eat that because it's sugar and carbohydrates and I'm over 60 and I have to be very, you know, can't do that. So then it became a yogurt, a croissant, a cookie and Doritos or something like that, you know. In fact, there's a chapter in my audio book uh i survived squid game i'm v i am vip number four which is be out in two weeks everywhere that's uh, called dorito heaven which is the only thing i could find in the store was Dor i don't like doritos you know but that was the only thing i could find you know right. i'm telling my kids don't get that doritos on the sofa what do you guys do you know that orange thing on your fingers so yeah, yeah you know cool and i came to kind of like not too much Cool Ranch Doritos, you know, because when I went into 7-Eleven, that's all I could see that didn't have a formerly have a mother and a face. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, there there are because you, you've had trouble with it because like uh, there are uh, sections of people that are uh, religiously vegetarian. You didn't kind of come up against that at all or find that at all? You know, if I tell people I'm a Hare Krishna, uh, people flip. Well, I don't, maybe they do. And it used to be worse, you know, because they've kind of, it's really just, I mean, I suppose it's Hinduism. So people don't really go on about it too much. But I, I don't really, I mean, I say it now because I'm, it's not only good for me, only good for me. Well, it's nothing bad at all. So, um, I'm proud of it now, but for years and years and years, I don't, this isn't really answering your question. I didn't, I didn't tell anybody about my religious affiliations. And I was actually one of the people that was um, uh, there with, oh, you just corrected my name. It was spelled wrong a minute ago. Now it's, oh, it's spelled wrong underneath and right up. It doesn't matter. Um, oh, we're so sorry. I, 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 I was um, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, Prabhupada, I was with him and I was like there at the beginning. I knew George Harrison from the Beatles and I was there when it all really started. So it's it's been a really good thing. I'm sorry that didn't answer your question. Oh, no, I was just kind of wondering if like, if you found anyone that was also a vegetarian. Uh, no, or... no, I did not. I did not. I'll tell you a story about that girl's breasts. You know how oh. I was supposed to lay down with that in that girl's breast were like the pillow. Yeah. So yeah. this girl's a really nice good girl called carla and a good actress very talented <clears throat> so she needed to pay the rent she told me so they gave her four thousand dollars to be a human furniture and so i got there and her breath she i said How, why did you get this part and she said because i have the biggest breasts of any westerner in korea mm -hmm. so okay and they were big you know so i I, I realize this is a minefield here. I have to be careful what I say. But <laughs> they said to me, all right, Mr. Giuliano, her breasts are your pillow. Put your head in her breast. So I kind of stayed about a foot away, hoping the camera would just look like I was there. And they said, no, no, you need to put your head in her breast, Mr. Giuliano. So I moved a few more millimeters up. Mr. Giuliano, put your head in her breast. So I said, Carla, she said, just do it, just do it, just do it. Boom. So there's my head and these two big breasts on either side of my head. And it was embarrassing and uncomfortable, but the whole movie was embarrassing and uncomfortable for me. You know, how many, you know, I didn't used to worry about nude scenes because I thought, well, who the hell is going to want to see me naked? And then apparently, do you know that 25% of the population of this planet, which is over a billion people, have seen my ass? Yep. And at school, I went to pick up my son at school, and all these teachers were going like, and all the students were going like, and I yeah. said, 
Why do we hear music? Why do we, why do we hear a radio? Oh, oh, it's background. Well, sorry, the music uh, gets a little loud sometimes. We don't know what happened. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So I'm oh, sorry. Was uh, oh, so when I pick them up at school, and one of the teachers goes like, "Hello, Mr. Giuliano. Hi, hi, hi." Uh, the so Van O'Brien, the worst is the actor who was the footstool. That's to tell them about him. Okay, so my buddy Van wants me to tell you he's moving stuff along. Hey, uh, there was one guy that was the footstool, mm-hmm. and he was a dancer, and he was a really nice guy, and he was Muslim. Now, I don't know if you know about Islam, but you can't put your feet on people in Islam, right? So, as soon as I knew, he told me his name was Muhammad, and I said, Salam alaikum. Because I'm a big respecter of being in a, a minority religion myself. Mm-hmm. Not that Islam is a minority religion. I'm, I'm respectful of people's religions. So I said, Salam Alaikum. And he was happy that I knew how to say that. And um, he said, yeah. And I said, look, man, what are we going to do here? I have to put my feet on you. That's not appropriate for a Muslim. And he said, no, 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 it's okay. And I said, yeah, but it's really not okay. No, 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 just do it. So I, it was a, the tits. Or the, sorry, the breasts, <laughs> the breasts and the feet on the guy. <clears throat> there was not one scene I was in that I was comfortable in. Mm-hmm. First, comfortable. It was all embarrassing. It was all uncomfortable. And it was all worth it. But at the time, I had to work through that. And I'll be honest with you, it threw my concentration. Mm-hmm. You know, being thrown into all this. Because I didn't know what was going to I didn't know there was any human furniture until they said, there's the human furniture. Touch her breasts, put your feet on her. You know, I didn't, I just had to do it, you know, but it's nothing. Yeah. I didn't, and I, and they, okay, and say, talk, hey, hey, talk about 69, okay? And, and like make jokes about oral sex, you know? I don't want to do any of that stuff, but I had to do it. Yeah. And I mean, when you, when you see the final product, it makes sense, you know, again, it, it, it kind of round out, rounds out that character, right? Like kind of how I've been mentioning how yeah, much I I'm, a pig. I'm yeah. a pig and everybody yeah. hates my guts, mm-hmm. you know? Um, by the way, I, I found out after the movie was over that they wanted me to, uh, to play Donald Trump. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I mean, if I got near Donald Trump, that's cool. We were both pigs, but you know, why didn't you tell me that when I was there, guys? You know, if you would have said, hey, we want you to play Donald Trump, I could have played Donald Trump, you know, not not an imitation, but I could have gotten in that neighborhood. So right. that was uh, very difficult to come in on a movie that's been shooting for a long time. Mm-hmm. If you don't know what went on before and what's going to go on afterward, it's 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 very difficult. But listen, if you're an, I'll tell you another thing that happens in a movie is they'll change, like you'll learn the script. And then they'll go, oh, Mr. Giuliano, hi, I'm the script person, and here's the new script. We're going to shoot in five minutes. What, 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 I'm sorry, what do you mean new script? You know what I mean. All those things that you, you learn out the window, and mm-hmm. this is what we're going to do today. Yeah. You've got 10 minutes before we shoot. Right. There, it's not easy to be an actor, man. It's tough. Yeah. You know, it's, in fact, they talk about actors coming to set without knowing their lines. But, you know, I often ask, was there rewrites 10 minutes before, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And it, 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 to be honest with you, it happened with Squid Game in the sense that I had learned. My, see, I don't learn things. If you're doing Shakespeare, nobody can yeah. ad lib in Shakespeare. But anything right. other than that, like, for instance, like uh, you could say, Hey, listen, uh, I'm a little thirsty. I think I'll go to 7-Eleven and get a drink. Or you could say, yeah, man, I'm parched. I want to get a beverage. I think I'll go over to, to the convenience store. It's the same thing. The words are different. Right. And usually, almost always, no one gives a shit. The only place it becomes a problem when you're in a movie is that they have to match and cut everything together. So right. if, you say, if you say drink in 7-Eleven, but in the next take you say beverage and convenience store, they can't cut that together. Right. Mm-hmm. So as long as it's kind of the same, that's nah, okay. But I had something happen on the set. They stopped me for not saying and, a and d in a conjunction, a conjunction in in in, in the. They stopped the take. I thought that was strange. And I said, "Okay, I'm sorry." Next take, 
and hold on cut you forgot to say the i'm so sorry next take and and the the next take cut you forgot to say and, and i said what difference does it make and 300 people started looking down at the floor and then a little voice came that's fine mr giuliano we're moving on so it's like sometimes they become silly about it you know yeah in fact usually okay if it's a writer director this stuff happens it doesn't happen if a director is just hired and handed a script he doesn't care if you say every word mm -hmm. but if some guy's sitting in a little room with no money and he's bleeding that script out he's gonna not want some goofy actor to come in and start ad-libbing or changing any single word right but there's another thing too let's be fair to the koreans they don't understand what i was saying probably yeah so if it's not exactly on the paper it's like oh maybe he's saying something wrong and it won't make sense right so, you know there's a huge thing about language there that means that they feel insecure if you start to wander away from the script because what if you ruin the whole scene by saying why did he say woman if that a female that's supposed to be a man that's coming to pick him up in the scene whatever it is so you could kind of script it's not going to work and they could you know so they just they don't they err on the side of caution and make sure you say every word but that was a i would that's a very weird thing for me to have done it's like that was what difference does it make oh my right God. You know, why did, you know I, I was surprised myself with that but i was frustrated i was frustrated with nonsense you know right right uh so moving on to the next question here uh so th they've announced that they're going to be doing american versions of squid game and then also this is the big one that they're going to be doing a american version of train to busan which is apparently going to boston uh since you were in both of those or were you yeah. in of train to busan if they yeah. asked you to come on you know would you would you come on to those th those films Dude, I'm, an, I'm listen an actor is like a prostitute you know <laughs> If you pay me to do this, I'll do it. It doesn't come with the normal service, but if you want, oh, is that an extra service? Okay, we well, got to pay me this. So it's like, you know, <laughs> unless you're Tom Cruise, you're kind of like a, you know, like kind of like a prostitute. There's something there's you can draw an, as an inference there. $5 something. extra to land a woman next time. <laughs> no, I mean, if, yeah. What do you think? What a kind of stupid question is that? No. If they ask me to be in those movies, I'll tell them to get lost. I have no, I mean, but you know your point is i think the inner the network is called cw that's yeah. doing that thing i've tried to get in touch with them and my managers tried to get in touch with them it's you know those things are set up that there's a thing they say don't call us we'll call you mm -hmm. but you know one of the things i'm one of the reasons i'm doing all this media which i do I do anything anybody asks me. As you can see, I missed your show by doing somebody else's thinking it was you. I'll never, that's a story to tell the people. Yeah, um, you're having a better time now, man. I mean, I am. And I'll have to check people's ID from now on. You know, I told my manager, <laughs> you just like, it's a woman and it's a guy. And then instead of just there's a show at 10 o'clock, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to. I look, real life is a problem acting no problem you know mm -hmm. so that's my world that's where i am comfortable that's where i understand what's happening you know i understand what cameras and takes and clipboards and lights and scripts i and that is my world i understand that but when i'm out here so any shit can happen and it's all very real and i prefer to be in a movie thank you right What's the difference? Okay, now, the James Navarro says, "What's the difference?" I don't know if I'm supposed to read this. What's the difference in acting in the U.S. versus Korea? Or Korea? How much of the various languages do you have to learn? Okay, you don't have to learn any languages, James. Uh, they, they have a translator there, mm. and the translator will be very good if they're working for Netflix, and they'll tell you everything that you need to know. There's a lot of difference in working in America and working in foreign countries. Here's the countries I've worked in. India, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Korea. 
and America. But of these other ones, I've worked in very exotic locations. And there's a translator there. And um, I prefer to work outside of the United States. I mean, not if they're going to give me millions of dollars. But, you know, my experience with America kind of ran its course. Mm -hmm. Um, the last time I was in America, I was in a place called Avalon, Pennsylvania, and I got stopped by the police and I asked, why have you pulled me over? And he said, you didn't signal your lane change. And when I turned around after fooling around with license and being there for 15 minutes, I looked around and the SWAT team was there. The hell? And they, they were leaning over the car with guns pointed at me. So I put my hands out the window of the car. And I said, what, what is this? You know, what, what is this? And they said, well, we just want to make sure about officer safety. You know, so it's like, man, I don't, you know, I don't know about America. That was a big thing for me to have to experience. I, I made an unsafe lane change. Are you crazy? You know, but well, you know, we can never be careful, never be too careful about officer safety, Mr. Giuliani. So they gave me a ticket and I left, but it left a really bad taste in my mouth, man. I'm, I'm, you know, I, Hey, I'm, I'm the right color. You know, why are you talking about shooting me? You know? So I, I, I like Taco Bell, Walmart's convenient. I don't have a lot of use for America other than that. I'm not really that concerned with where I issued forth from a vaginal cavity in 1953. I don't, I don't see how that makes me any more American than it makes me a citizen of the world. Right. Right. Well, Speaking of growing up, um, what were the things that you were interested in as a kid? Um, was there anything that you geeked out on as a kid? Acting, uh, English movies, like A Christmas Carol was the movie that made me want to be an actor with Alistair Sims, which you can find on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, having a little hammer and breaking up open rocks on the beach and finding beautiful crystals inside illustrating to me that there was more to life than what's on the surface that there might be some beauty inside nice. um writing poetry drawing girls <laughs> and then there was girls and then <laughs> girls again and um then when the hippie movement came i became immediately a hippie i'm not a hippie anymore but it was only when the last four or five years that I decided, no, you're not a hippie. That's over. But I've always held those ideas. Um, thinking for myself and questioning authority, um, uh, riding 10 speed bicycles. I was one of those guys. They don't, we didn't have helmets and all that. We just, I used to like a car. <laughs> I could go 40, 50 miles, like, you know, in an hour or something. It was, it was crazy. So those 10 speed bicycles, I suppose they still have them. I, couldn't even get on one now. Um, riding my bicycle, uh, swimming. Um, going did you like comic books or? Yes, yes, I did. If I had the comic books I bought as a kid in that 1959, 60, 63, I wouldn't be talking to you guys. I'd be on some kind of a boat somewhere. I remember I had all those super, I had super horse, superman, super cat. Super Dog. I think his name was Streaky. I had Super, all those Superman comic books. I had all the original, obviously. It was 10 cents. They were. Mm -hmm. you probably know, would still be talking to us because we do talk about comic books and, and all that kind and of stuff. I, I also collected something called Famous Monsters of Filmland. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I collected those. I had those because I used to, you know, it was kind of cute and sad. Hey, mom. Uh, the Wolfman's going to be on Friday at 11 o'clock. I can't wait. And I'd wait all week and I'd, you know, I'd get whatever, my drinks, my popcorn, and I'd be there. My mother, well, I'm going to bed, Jeff. Okay, I'm going to watch. Wow, Lon Chaney Jr. I love it, the Wolfman. And then, like, the, it would come on Universal Pictures and it would come around and I'd wake up at four in the morning and go, ah, what happened? Oh, shit, man, I fell asleep. <laughs> I missed all, but I'll tell you one of the things that made me cry a little bit all those years as a little kid on that sofa watching that universal twirling around and that universal coming and there's about four movies I've made for some reason I'm always on at the beginning not always but many times I've been the first guy you see in the movie and I made a movie called Hard Target 2 
And if you watch that, this thing comes on. <laughs> Universal. Big name Universal. And then you see me. I cried a little bit. I cried, but I got weepy about it. Because, you know, I think about that little boy. Mm -hmm. You know, that little boy, that little Jeffrey, that little kid didn't really have a father. You know, I lived in a kind of dreamy world. I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be a movie star, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that kid, uh, my mother, you know, we were very poor and my mother would take me to acting lessons. What Any extra money we did have were spent on lessons for me. And... My mother had holes in her shoes. So when, when there was like a Tampa community theater, very hot, she would sit out in the car because she didn't want to embarrass me by coming in and showing the holes in her shoes. So the other women, and they were all rich, you know, in the theater is usually rich people. So, the, oh, Mrs. Giuliano, why don't you come in? All the, all the mothers are having a little, oh, no, that's okay. I'll just stay here in the car. And I knew why she stayed in the car because she didn't want to embarrass me with the holes in the shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes I'll talk to my mother. I'll talk to my father. And uh, they were very interested in me being an actor. And, um, yeah, it's a personal journey. And... Uh, no one else can replicate my journey, but everybody has their own journey that they have to take in life. But it's being an actor is not any surface thing for me. It's deep, deep, deep within my psyche of of any of who I am in this material world, in this incarnation is very deeply uh, connected to acting. I do have to ask because um I'm I'm a huge Shakespeare fan myself. When did you fall in love with the Bard? Do, were, was it when you were younger or in college? I'll tell you what happened. I was at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, Florida, as their best acting student, and I was called up. My teacher got to call me into the office and said, "Would you like to play Macbeth?" What are you talking about? Macbeth is like sixty years old. I'm eighteen. They said, "I know," but the actor the actor that was going to play Macbeth has fallen off the stage in rehearsal and broken his leg and they're about to do the show. So, you know, I was so stupid that I said, okay. And I learned all those words for Macbeth mm. and I got, oh, really, I got really good reviews for it. But I mean, an 18 year old kid is not supposed to play Macbeth, but if you go to jeffreygiuliano.com to the homepage, there's a photograph of me playing Macbeth, but it's funny because I was to kiss lady Macbeth. It was the biggest part I ever had. I was 18. And when I was kissing her, I stuck my tongue in her mouth. Uh, dude, that's not how you're supposed to do it's not kiss in a movie. <laughs> 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 you're that's just supposed to kind of smush your mouth around. You don't be sticking your tongue. And she was really justifiably really upset. But I didn't know any better. I was just a kid, you know. But I certainly <laughs> know now, whenever I do that stuff, I brush my teeth and uh, all that. So it's, that, was, that, that, was, <laughs> that was that was that was a good lesson for me. I wondered why she was so pissed off and stormed off stage. You know, <laughs> finally the, the stage manager said, that, "What happened?" Oh, there's a funny story about a funny story. A lot of funny things happen. I was to go on stage in a theater production, and at that time I had an infection. Uh, what do they call the infection you get in your penis? Like, uh, it wasn't, it's was just like some kind of infection. So when you have this infection, are we talking urinary tract? Yes. Okay. Yes. When you have to pee, you have to pee. Mm -hmm. So there was a woman cleaning the bathroom and I couldn't get in the bathroom and I had to go on stage. So there, I looked around the room and there was a teapot. It was in London. It was a teapot. So I grabbed the teapot and whipped it out and I pissed in the teapot. I put the tap on and put it back, went on stage and forgot about it. Well, that that evening I was in wherever I was and I got a call from my agent and said, um, Jeffrey, uh, was there some incident that occurred this evening? I said, uh, what, Robert? No, what are you talking about? Well, uh, in your dressing room, was there a teapot? And uh, I, yeah, do you understand that the producer and the director and some guests went into that dressing room after you went on stage to have a cup of tea? Oh. 
Oh, uh, oh man! Oh, I'm like, Robert, I couldn't wait. I have a urinary tract in. Oh yeah. Oh so. man. Yeah, man. I, I want to know how far yeah. that got before they figured it uh, out. They, I guess they were starting to like somebody was there looking in. What the hell? <laughs> They're looking in there and it's full of piss, you know. And this was a very, That's very money. fancy. This was a super fancy, expensive situation all the way around with okay. all. Up and, you know, English people, they don't really like to come out with like, like one time I got arrested in England when I was a kid and the policeman said, I'm so sorry to inconvenience you, Mr. Giuliano, but if you wouldn't mind, would you be kind enough to accompany me to the station? They don't do that in America. No. Nope. Get, get the taser, you know, you know, um, but, you know, English people, it's like, he really didn't want to come out with it. It's like, was there an incident today? Something you'd like to tell me about? Pops. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I love England. I love dealing with the English people because they're, you know, they're very nice people. Mm -hmm. But I, I pissed in a teapot in London and I got busted. <laughs> it happens. Oh, or man. in this case, piss happens. At least you had a pot to piss. I had a pot to piss in in London. <laughs> but I, obviously I didn't have a window to throw it out. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Very good. All right. Uh, let's go into some learning questions here. <laughs> so, being that you're a big movie guy, right? Yeah, what I'm a big be, movie star. Yeah. <laughs> what would be the worst movie sequel ever made? Worst is, is a Grand Canyon. Worst is a universe. Worst is a solar system. It's better to talk about what's best. Because worst is the order of the day. Well, then, worst, if we do that, yeah, like what what sequel would you like to see made then? Like to see made, uh, the Royal Tannenbaums was a great movie. Anything by Wes Anderson is a great movie. He's got. I mean, it's not, it's not a movie. It's, it's another planet. Right. It's another. He creates environments. Right. Grand Budapest they, they're Hotel. Kind of, they're kind of like movies. But there's something other than that, you mm -hmm. know? Everything is just, it's like, there's an artist called Peter Max from the 60s. And he created, he's a friend of mine. And I say, you know, this is like a place that you created. And Wes Anderson movies are like a place. So the Royal Tannenbaums, I showed it to my 14-year-old son. And he was just, I don't like that girl. Who's that girl that has the blonde-headed girl that has that website, Goop? She was a star uh, of that. Um the blonde. Yeah. She's, yeah, in, yeah. she's in Marvel too. Um, yeah. Oh. Everybody in the audience knows. Somebody write it in. Guaranteed but look, can say it here. anyway, I don't like her. And I kept saying, oh, that's that girl with goop. They sell $15,000 gold two picks with a diamond in the Gwyneth top. Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow. But I liked, her in, I, liked her, I liked her in the Royal Tannenbaums. And you know who else was, the people don't know, is the narrator of the Royal Tannenbaums was Alec Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, actually, everybody, all my kids say that I, that I remind them of Royal Tannenbaum, the, the con man, you know, the kind of near-do-well. And that beautiful wife played by Angelica Houston is very much like my late wife. So... Um, yeah, I would say the Royal Tan. I'd like to see what happened with the Royal Tannenbaums and anything the Wilson brothers, Owen and his brother, are in. Mm -hmm. I like, I like that too. But you know, I like the brother. The brother get kind of got a. What's the brother's name with the dark hair? You know, there's Owen Wilson and something Wilson. Um, <sighs> Trivia question now. But anyway, no. he's really yeah. good, and he didn't get to be the movie star. I'm sure he's doing okay. But I, I, I think he's a good actor, and I always enjoy seeing more. You know, the the secret uh, about. Luke yeah. What's his name? Luke Wilson. Luke Wilson. Right. And there's also, they have a younger brother named Andrew Wilson, who's also an actor. Yeah, it's like the Baldwins. The whole family yeah. jumps in there. It Look, happens acting, a lot. Acting is not doing anything. You know, it's like you say to me, like, all right, listen, we're going to meet at seven o'clock and we're going to, I'll pick you up. You, you want to get something to eat? It's like, all right, listen. We're going to meet at seven o'clock. If you want to get something to eat, I think that might be a good idea. It's not what people do. They just do. Hey, listen, man, we'll meet at seven. I don't know. I'll pick you up at seven, seven thirty. You do very little and you listen. You have to listen. 
You know, there's like 50% of this thing is listening to what the other guy is saying. But if I'll tell you what, uh, someone once asked uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins, his best acting advice. And he said, learn your lines. Because if you're, and I've been there before, if you're reaching for a line with the camera on, you can't color it. You can't make it real. You can't flow into the next thing. Um, it's So you have to learn your lines and you have to learn them like, you know, you, you can't be searching or reaching, as we say. You can't reach for a line, which I have done on set because it just, then it becomes fake, you know. So learn your, learn your lines. Who did you Line. just yell for? Line. <laughs> no, and that, that's bullshit because okay. then what is it? Line and then you keep going? I've done that. They always say <laughs> cut at the end of it. Like, yeah, I'm Tom Cruise. Line. Yeah, yeah right. right. Cut. Yeah. Going off that, what would you no no, no, I made a French movie once where I asked for a line and they just kept going. The guys, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. So, because, you know, there's a mood that you create. And if you screw up, you can break that mood really easy. And sometimes you can't get it back. But so, that's something that you mentioned earlier, too, is, is when it comes to that type of acting, it's like once you know your character and you know what your character would say, then that's where you can ad lib. You know, like if you go off the script, because I've seen that happen a lot where it's like someone goes off a script and it's like, you know what? I like the line you just ad libbed better than the line I have on the script. So we're going to go with that. Yeah. I'm but the director, too, because some directors are a little more. No, no. Yeah. Look, I saw. Well, uh, uh, what's his name? Dirty Harry. Clint Eastwood. Oh, Clint Eastwood. When he's a director. One time an actor asked him for acting advice. And, you know, how, how do you want me to do this? And he said, didn't you go to acting school? Yeah, you did. Didn't they? Didn't they cover it? Did, wasn't it covered in the curriculum? I'm not here to give you acting lessons. Just get out there and do it. You know. So there's, there's, there, but there's two. And Woody Allen, the same thing. He never gives just whatever they do, whatever the actor does is good. <clears throat> but there's other people like Warren Beatty, where you have to do the take 80 times. Because I interviewed Catherine Hepburn once, and she told me that she walked off the set. You know, you've had 75 takes, young man. That'll be more than enough. You know, so uh, there are people that go crazy. I like to do lots of takes mm -hmm. because I'm insecure and I want to do as many takes as I possibly can to get the best result, because I understand that this thing is forever. Mm -hmm. I made a mistake in Squid Game, which I'll point out to everybody and you'll never be able to not see it. My first line in the movie is. Well, listen, I'll give anybody some slack, but uh there's no problem with that, but I'm a difficult man to please. I hope you won't disappoint me. But what I was supposed to say was, well, I'm willing to cut anybody some slack. That's not a problem. I said, give slack. Mm -hmm. Now, if this had been an English language movie, they would have said, cut, Mr. Giuliano, you cut people slack. You don't give them slack. Mm -hmm. But since nobody was... And you can see me hesitate for a minute. I almost stopped the take. There's a trick. If you don't like the way the take is going, you can stop it and say, oh, I forgot my line. And then they have cut. They have to stop it. They won't. They don't. There's money involved. They don't want to stop. So it's like, uh, well, uh, I can give you some slack. And I, I just a second where I hesitate, I, not even a second thinking, oh, should I stop the take? You can see it on my face. I can see it on my face. Everybody. Now you won't be able to unsee it now, but. That would be a, an incidence where the previous question of James Navarro saying, well, what's the difference of making movies in Korea and America? Well, that would be one because they would have stopped the take and say, Mr. Giuliano, the line is cut some slack. I made a movie, Scorpion King 3. And mm -hmm. I said, your wife was a great prophetess. Now, there is a word of a female prophet called prophetess. Mm -hmm. But the guy, some guy in the back yelled out wizard or well, I can't remember the word, but it was a completely different word. Um, so, you know, all this stuff matters. And sometimes it, sometimes it matters a lot. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all. And you're kind of a, an actor. You're, you're literally in my case, literally, but figuratively naked up there. You know, they move you or you're like a, a pawn on a chessboard. They move you around and make you do what you got to do. And you have to have, you know, people say, uh, Actors are egotistical, but on the other level, you have to be almost egoless to put up with a lot of the humiliation that it is to be an actor. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I got another question for you here. So if you were on a 10 hour flight, past, present, dead or alive, who's the one person that you would want to sit on a 10 hour flight with? It used to be John Lennon. Uh, I've met, met and talked to two of the Beatles, George and Paul, mm -hmm. and I've seen all of the Beatles. Uh, it used to be John Lennon. Um, uh, I'm really annoying to people on flights because I talk a lot and they, I can just see they're just waiting for this flight to get over. So this lunatic will shut up. <laughs> uh, John Lennon, Dennis Hopper might be one. Marlon Brando would be okay. one. A lot of acting heroes. Um, you know, I, I used to like Robert De Niro, but I don't like what he does now because I think there's a lot of motivation for money as opposed mm -hmm. to art al pacino i think should have retired a, a while ago i mean they can do what they want you know I, i'm not trying to right. who am i to say but i mean i i think you know that's one of the to change the subject is like i'm over 60 and i'm not trying to look young i'm trying to look as good as i can look over 60 but i'm not trying to do any phony shit to look young mm -hmm. um you gotta know when to stop now i think i got another six years, seven years, but if it got to be embarrassing, if it got to be weird, if it got to be like, un like I just saw where the Rolling Stones were having trouble hitting the notes in the guitar. I just saw that. And they're like about three or four days ago, like the, the reviewer said they couldn't hit the notes. Paul McCartney, the long and winding road. You know, you know, dude, it's over. It's over, yeah. you know? So uh, this is, uh, I would say, all my acting heroes I'd like to sit with and, and possibly John Lennon. But after I got to know him by writing several books about him and writing a book with his sister, my respect for him went down just a little bit. Mm. Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones I liked. Right, People right. Liked all right, we're going to get into a couple of wrap-up questions here. Uh, really? Because oh, have we done half an hour? Oh no, we've done more. We, this is the longest two hours. Hour. Yeah, <laughs> we've done almost two hours here, and it's great. I'm okay with it. Um, your favorite topic? Oh, if you're okay with it, then I guess it's okay. Anyone else? Cares? Hey man, we've been having a great time. <laughs> we've been having all kinds of fun. So yeah. uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a little bit past dinner in America now. So oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so your favorite kind of taco, uh, we have a big thing on our show. We talk about tacos all the time and we love, I love okay. I love Mexican food. I'm a vegetarian. Ooh. I like to be, I like to be in Los Angeles and there's those places where they don't speak English. Those oh. are the best places. We I just love, love. you know, I'm English. I even like, <laughs> I even like Taco Bell. The senor I, get, I, I get a bean burrito. <laughs> and I love, I love absolutely. See, when you start asking me what my favorite Mexican food is, I know it's the end of the show. No, no actually, Jeffrey, I, I got to tell you this. <laughs> when was the last time you, uh, or have you ever been to San Francisco? Of course I've been to San Francisco, dude. Okay. There is a restaurant. I was a hippie. Yeah, I'm from San Francisco originally, but I mean, there is, in the mission now, there is a restaurant called Gracias Madre, right? Check yeah. that out next time you're there. It's a vegan Mexican no, restaurant. No, no, no. Next time I'm there, you're going to take me and you're going to pay. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's fine. I will do yeah, that. That's all good. One hundred percent, we'll do that. I don't drink, so it's not going to cost too much. <laughs> I am one hundred percent willing. To take uh, let me ask you, what's going on at Haight Ashbury now? Uh I mean, it's still somewhat hippie-ish over there. It's 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 what modern hippie is. It's not like the same type of hippie, but I mean, um, yeah, there's there's. A lot of homelessness down there, but I mean, it's a lot of like you know, like people take care of each other down over there. So I mean, I, I, I've always been about going down there. More hipsters than there are hippies over there now. Hipsters are the evolution at this point. Yeah. When I when I was a millionaire rock writer, uh, I had to go to San Francisco to do a promotion of some kind. Yeah. And we there was a hippie hotel that was just like the '60s. It was you know two three hundred dollars or something, and we stayed there for the night. And they had day glow on the wall and black light and everything. So I stayed down there. When I was a kid in '67, there was this kid 
called Steve Capitano. He was like a real brush cut and football. And I went to the boys club and I said, where's Steve? Steve ran away to hate Ashbury to be a hippie. <laughs> so, wow, that's the last guy. He got, got a hold of one of those little pills like I got a hold of in junior high and took the LSD. <laughs> and became a hippie. So it's like this, this LSD had the power to turn like jocks into hippies. So yeah. Steve, about two weeks later, I see Steve. He says, Steve, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be a hippie. He said, yeah, my, my parents came and got me and brought me back. You know, I always wondered about that. So, yeah, I was too afraid to run away and be a hippie. I just stayed in Tampa and was a hippie around the house. Okay. <laughs> uh, any advice or tips for anyone looking to get into acting, either overseas or here in the States? Don't do it. <laughs> if you want to have a secure financial future, if you want to have a good personal relationship with your significant other, if you want to be a good father or mother to your children, if you want to be a respected member of your society, do not do it. However, however, if you can't help it, if it's a compulsion, if you're going to kill yourself, if you don't, if it means the world to you, do it and your luck will find you predicated on your level of preparedness because success in this material world is opportunity meeting preparedness. It's like this. Being an actor is like being a fireman. Every day the fireman goes to the station. He checks the hoses. He washes the dog. He makes sure there's gas in the car. Um, he does everything he has to do to get ready for a fire. And then there's no fire. There's no fire this week. There's no fire next week. There's no fire next month. Maybe there's no fire in a year. But someday the bell's going to ring and there's going to be a fire and you've got to be ready for that. So I spend a lot of time, like with my hair and stuff, say, oh, well, in case they call me, like, I, I don't like a beard, but I look better in a beard. So I say, I want to shave this. But oh, shit, I've got interviews. And it hides a little thing under here, like a double chin, like, loose skin so it's like all these weird things that you would never have to think about if you were like had a normal job you right. have to think about like what will look cool on on tv yeah okay so i have the godzilla shirt with this over it I have the cool glasses make sure my hair is a little bit messed up on the top it doesn't look too flat so all these weird things you have to consider if you want to live your life like that if you want to be rejected if you want to be kept from opportunity because you're good at your job and people are jealous if you want to have no financial security, then be an actor. And But don't be an actor if you want to be a star. Don't be an actor if you think you're going to make any money because those things will not happen. Um, it's unfortunate. As actually, I was thinking the other day, it's kind of unfortunate that Squid Game happened to me because now I've got my hopes up. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been encouraged. If I was not as mature as I am, I could be a little bit heartbroken if something doesn't happen. Do I think I won't make a movie? No. Do I think someone's going to hire me? Yeah, somebody's going to hire me uh, because I know how to do this. And I was in Squid Game and had a big part. So I think it'll like work out okay. But like I said, so far, I haven't had any offers. And I'm, you know, my agent said, just calm down there. Let them focus on the Koreans. Things will filter down. You can always say that you had a big part. in. See, there was a contract that I saw with Netflix logo on it. I saw this. I don't have it, but I saw it. Mm -hmm. it said it listed the stars of Squid Game, and there were 14, and I was number 14. I am a star of Squid Game. I'm the last star, but I am a star. It's actually another other word is principal. I think it said principal cast. Mm -hmm. What do you do exactly count that? The, I, <laughs> yeah. I count it. I absolutely. If this well, thing, Here's another, here's another thing, Phoenix. Look. No, I mean, I meant like they don't, they don't listen to numbers. They're, they're not going to say like, oh, he was the 14th one. No, it him. doesn't matter. I yeah. Really, you know, yeah. I you're, him. you're, you're on that list is basically yeah. what Excuse it is. me. Yeah. Excuse me. I I <laughs> you you may as well be number one. Yeah, I'm you may just number listen. 14, baby. <laughs> you, can't, you can't take that away from me. I, am I don't know. She's saying it's a good thing. She's saying that you're yeah. on that list, and it doesn't yeah. matter whether you're one or 14, you're on that list. Yeah. yeah. It does matter. 
it mm-hmm. does matter because number one got $2 million. That's oh, why it matters. Oh, okay. The check. The check. Okay, we're yeah. on you now. Now, you know. <laughs> it, it, it is called show business. It's not it's the last time I checked called show fun. You know, it's called show yeah. business. Very little about this shit is fun. You okay. know, this is the most fun you can have is the promotion. But since I've never done promotion on a movie, you know, so I'll tell you one thing about me is I don't like to lie to people like, yeah, I'm some big actor and stuff. Look, I was a working actor that did 28 films that only my mother noticed and she's dead. So uh, it didn't it didn't move the needle. Like one of my best friends called me and said, hey, hey, you moved the needle. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I did. I moved the, but I, did I move the needle or did co- probably COVID? Move, I, I always tell people if there was no COVID there probably would be no squid game. No. We live in this dark dystopian world mm-hmm. where there's uh, authoritarianism uh, and dictators coming up everywhere and trying to, you know, you know, people are getting shot on their way to 7-Eleven if they're possibly a certain color, skin color, and more melatonin when they were coming out of the, you know, when they were created as a child. So um, <clears throat> all these things, these terrible, and there's an airborne virus that will kill you, a horrible death, no matter how healthy you are and how much you work out. If you breathe that shit in, you're going to die, and right. you're going to die from suffocation. So because this is a 1984 um, Orwellian world, dystopian, dark, black world of death, suit uh, seems to, to be winning over life, the kids can't go to school. People are locked in their houses. They're suspicious. Does he have the virus? It's kind of like a zombie movie we're living in. Squid Game was successful. Plus, we're all physically at home and watch TV all day. Right. It's more like M. Night Shyamalan. I don't remember people using the <laughs> when I was growing up. Nobody said they were binge watching anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm binge watching. What the hell is that? You know. So this is. It's not a good thing. The Squid Game is so popular. It's a symptom of the black mirror that we're looking through of our lives with a lot of hopelessness around. You know, hey, well, we got we got vaccination now. We're done with the COVID. You're not done with shit. Yeah. That mm-hmm. that thing will change itself. It will morph itself, and it will kill many, many more yep, before it's it You know. So that's this is. The, I promise you, if everything was cool, there would be no Squid Game. <laughs> yeah. That is an interesting phenomenon that um, things like Tiger King uh, are a thing since uh, because nobody was we we're bored. We were all very bored and the darkest. Bits well, you, you can't even have you can't even. How could you have sex with anyone? You know, just <laughs> let's go back to the basics. Tell me how you could. How you could have sex with someone that you didn't know. You know, sometimes people yeah. do that. You know, you're going to kiss them. You're going to sway bodily fluid. You couldn't do it. It's riskier Uh, than ever. It's riskier than ever. AIDS was a cakewalk. There was, you know, but if you could start French kissing somebody, I mean, you're going to get it, you know? So I don't know how you're ever going to get around COVID. It's never going to go away now. You know, I mean, maybe if we're lucky, it'll be like polio and we can eradicate it. But if you have all these cowboys and yahoos running around saying a vaccination has got a microchip in it and they're going to track you on you know when you go to 7-eleven and all this nonsense that the people are saying um then uh then it's it's just only going to make matters worse and it's just gonna you know i just they had riots now in belgium and europe of people saying there's going to be another lockdown and people said no we're not going to do that again and just you know it's world unrest and that's the world that gave birth to Squid Game. <laughs> and with that thought, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about where people can find you um, so that we can keep track of you and um, maybe in the future uh, stalk me. you. Employ yeah, me. stalk you. Impl- <laughs> yeah. But if anybody wants to follow you and, and keep up with um, Jeffrey Giuliano. Yeah. If you're, if you're the police, Interpol, the FBI, or, or a bill collector, you can't find me. Okay. Good. Luckily, if, I'm not. I'm a fan. If, if you have a if you have a movie for me or you're a fan and want to get in touch, you can go to jeffreygiuliano.com, which is G E O F F R E Y G I U L I A N O.com. 
You can also go to VIP Force Squid Game Universe on Facebook. You can go to the Jeffrey Giuliano channel on YouTube. You can go to TikTok where you can find me under Squid Game Confidential. And finally, you can go to uh, Instagram and find me at Jeffrey Actor, G E O F F R E Y A C T O R. Uh, that's how you, or you can, and if you go, if you really want to contact me, you can go to JeffreyGiuliano.com, go to contact, and then all my details are there. Excellent. Now, does this go on YouTube later? Yes, yes sir. Uh, as soon as we end the broadcast, it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on Twitch. It'll be on Facebook. Uh, Facebook Live. Send it to all send, your, your followers. Send me the URL. Absolutely. Thank, well. I'll send thank you, you so it. much. Uh, Jeffy, it has been such a pleasure. I hope. I don't know. It, it went from 30 minutes on our regular show to almost a two-hour interview, and I could not be happier. I think we yeah. had so much fun doing this, man. I, I enjoyed everything that you said <laughs> and everything that came out of you was great. So, uh, I highly appreciate you coming on, man. Again, we ended up making it a full show just on you. And I, I love that it ended up being what it is. So, uh, guys, uh, everybody that's watching, of course you can find us at distance nerding on all social media, uh, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook live. Uh, if it exists, we're on it. So, uh, Outside of that, guys, we'll see you on Wednesday for the news. Uh, it's time for the dance party. Je uh, Jeffrey, we didn't tell you about the dance party, but basically I play our theme music and we kind of just dance, I dance in the area. By all means, so let's get it. <laughs> and... Distance learning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>